hi there and thanks for watching. Over the next few minutes, I'll be walking you through my industrial development model. Now keep in mind, this is a specialty model. It's focused on ground up merchant build industrial development opportunities. And so that assumes you're looking at a development opportunity with the intention of developing it, leasing it up, and then selling it at stabilization. Now, when you download the model, you'll start here on the version tab. You'll notice that this video is based on beta version 0.1. In the coming months, I'll add uh, new features uh, and roll out updates as I identify bugs. Um, and so this is the initial release of the model. Now, if you've used our apartment development model or our self-storage development model, um, then this model will feel very comfortable because the general layout is similar. So you'll see here, when you open up the model, you'll have the version tab, you'll have a summary tab that summarizes the, the findings or the results of your underwriting. The underwriting then is uh, done on the underwriting tab. So let's start here. Now along the top, you'll have a navigation bar where uh, you can really click any of these buttons and it will take you to sections within the model. Now, this model is similar to, like I said, our apartment development model where all of your inputs are in one tab. And so uh, the inputs are along the left-hand side of this tab and then the resulting cash flows from the inputs that you add to the left side are visualized and calculated out here to the right. And then from top to bottom, you have the various sections of the model, the various modules, if you will, of the model. So it starts at the, the very top with an investment description section where you enter uh, some details about location and the physical elements of, of the property. Then we move into investment period cash flows. These are your development cash flows. So your hard costs, your soft costs, your land costs. Uh, it's going to break out between sources and uses, so again, uses being your costs, sources being those sources of capital to fund your costs. Uh, currently, the model only allows for, on the sources side, either equity or a construction loan. Over time, I'll add, uh, or I'll, I'll expand your sources option, but for now, it's just equity and debt. Now, in terms of entering uh, uh, costs, Again, blue font cells or input cells. So under each of the categories, you'll enter values. You can add additional line items and delete line items from each of the sections, clicking these buttons like so. All right, so you can add multiple soft costs, hard costs, line items. And then out to the right, you choose a start month and an end month for when those cash flows are to be forecast, and then some method for forecasting those cash flows. Straight line, S-curve, or you can detail. And when you detail, what you'll see out to the right is the cells turn blue, and you would then detail out those cash flows. And if you're, the sum of your detailed cash flows don't match the budget, then you get an incomplete sign here, and you'll have to make sure that the total of your detailed cash flows equal your budget. And so I'm just gonna turn this back to say S-curve. Well, this is land cost, let's leave it at straight line. But here we have hard cost, say uh, S-curve. And if you'd like to change the steepness of your S-curve, you'll come down, right click, unhide the data tab, and here you'll find the steepness. And by default, I use a steepness of six, 10 being the most steep, one being flat. Uh, and then you have a graph that visualizes your steepness. So we could change this say to an eight. And you're gonna have now more cash flow going out in the middle periods of, of your kind of forecast period and fewer cash flows at the front and the back. If you go to say one, it's almost straight line, All right? So come back again to six, uh, we'll hide this data tab. So that the, that's entering your budget and you can do that for each of the line items. The sum then of your total prog project cost before financing, you can see here. Then you'll add in some financing fees. Uh, it's going to automatically calcula calculate capitalized construction interest as well as your operating shortfall. And that's based on 
you know, the other assumptions that you put into the model. And then again, we have the sources. You can choose your loan to cost for the construction debt. You can choose either a fixed rate or a floating rate debt. And if it's floating, then out here to the right, you adjust your percentage, your interest rate. And these are annual interest rate. And then it's going to divide that by 12 to arrive at monthly rates when calculating the, constru the gross construction interest. Come back here to fixed. You can just adjust that rate like so. And then we move into the operating cash flow section, right? So our sources equal our uses. So we know it's working correctly. To get to our operating cash flow section, again, we can scroll down to it or just click this operations button and that will take us to the operating period cash flow section. Now within here, uh, we first have an operation begin month. So this is going to uh, be driven by, uh, all right now we have 19, right? And we're, what we'll do is we come up here and look at, okay, our construction ends month 18. So let's imagine that month 19 is when our operation begins. And then it tells us what our first stabilized month is based on our income and expenses. So we do that here. Now we can add tenants. We can delete tenants. So let's imagine that we have three tenants here, uh, 125,000 square feet for the first two, 250,000 for the third tenant. We then choose a lease start date. So that's the, that's the date when the tenant occupies. And then we have a rent start date, and that's when the tenant begins paying rent. And the difference then would be the free rent period for this first generation tenant. Then we have some rent growth per year for the tenant. Now keep in mind, because this is a merchant build model, uh, there are no second, third generation tenants. There is a leasing cost reserve that I'll show you in a minute, but it assumes that this first tenant will, this first generation of tenants will get you to sale. And then we have rent uh, for this larger tenant, let's put 450 a foot. And there we have our annual rent in year one, all right? And then it will grow 2% per tenant, or we could say do 3% on this tenant, and then it's gonna grow to roughly 247 per year. Uh, next, we have our recovery income, and we choose when the tenant begins to reimburse the landlord for operating expenses. And by default, it's set to lease start, but perhaps you want it to be at rent startups. 22, 25, 22. And now the tenant begins to reimburse the landlord for operating expenses as of rent start rather than lease start. Uh, but again, you could change that to any, really any month. Uh, then you have recovery percentage, right? So 100% means this is a uh, tr true triple net with no leakage. The, the tenant is paying for, or the landlord is recovering 100% of operating expenses. And then this calculates the pro rata share of operating expenses that each tenant is reimbursing. It's an orange font cell, meaning more than likely the, calc the uh, formula and the result of that formula is correct. However, there may be cases where uh, there's a unique clause in the lease that, that requires the tenant to reimburse more or allows the tenant to reimburse less than its pro rata share based on net rentable area. So that's recovery income. We then have a general vacancy and credit loss assumption. So we change that to 6%. Next, we move into operating expenses. And because the tenant's reimbursing 100%, it really doesn't matter um, in this case. But just so you can see, you change your expenses here. Um, uh, management fee like so insurance let's make this 50 cents and property tax a dollar 50. now what you'll see is as you're making these changes this this red click to recalculate button appears at the top and if you click it what will happen is it's going to run two macros that will iterate the cash flows to solve for a few circular references the first circular reference is related to construction interest and so you'll notice as you make changes to your budget or to your sources uh, to your, your debt assumptions, I should say, that that button will appear. And the, the, the other iterative calc that it's doing is related to management fee. Since management fee is a recoverable 
uh, operating expense, and but at the same time, the management fee is charged on effective gross revenue. There's a circular reference here and requires iterating to solve for it. And so when we change, say, this assumption, you'll notice the amount doesn't change there. And that's because this amount, you'll notice, is a hard-coded value that's arrived at by clicking this button. Click to recalculate. In the background, it runs, it iterates. Notice that changes, and now the red button goes away saying that no more iterations are necessary. Uh, then we move into capital expenditures. Now again, uh, what this is solving for really is understand how much cash flow would one would, would a, uh, a developer ha perhaps have to reserve uh, if, if it were to hold long term. It, the, the developer may want to reserve that from the get-go and therefore those cash flows should be accounted for in the pro forma or in the DCF. Uh, now, if you don't want any leasing reserve, you would just zero out, uh, say, these. And we can zero out these as well. All right, and now there would be no leasing reserve. Uh, and you see that here, leasing cost reserve. In most cases, you'll want to model some leasing cost reserve just as you're calculating your returns, you should account for some leasing cost out into the future, but maybe maybe that's not important to you, so you could leave that at zero. And the next is a cap a capex reserve. Again, may or may not reserve for capex. More than likely, there's going to be some some capital expenditures that you as an owner will be responsible for uh, that, that you may be spending money on before you sell sell. Uh, so that's the capex reserve, and that's the 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 end of our operating cash flow section. Next, we have reversion, right? So we click this reversion at sale button. It takes us here and we have some assumptions along the top. We have a sale month, all right? So this is the month that the sale occurs in. By default, it's set to 12 months following stabilization. But here, let's say at the end of year four. And then we have some market cap rate today. If this building were operating it was fully leased and done and we could buy it today, at what cap rate would this building trade for? And then we have some cap rate at sale, our terminal cap rate. What do we think that's going to be? And, and in this case, right now, I just left them the same, but perhaps we grow our cap rate by 50 basis points over the four years. And we say the cap rate at sale is of 6%, whereas we think market cap rates for, for similar buildings today would be five and a half. Some selling costs. Uh, what is it gonna cost to sell the building at the end of our four year analysis period? And then we have a, uh, a reversion pro forma. And by default, this is year five of, and you see it here, month 48 through 59, uh, roughly year five of our analysis. But it's left blue because you, make, you may make adjustments to that reversion pro forma based on what you know about the market. So perhaps you'll make some, uh, mo most likely a change you'd make here would be related to property tax, even though that wouldn't impact your value because uh, your recovery income is 100%, or you may account for some slippage in recovery income, or uh, you, know, you may haircut rents or increase rents because maybe you're, you're, you're gonna lease at below market rents, but you think the subsequent buyer might account for that and, and pay uh, based on a pro forma of, of market rents. So whatever that may be, you have the ability to adjust your reversion pro forma. And then you can see the value both at stabilization, right? so when you uh, fully lease the building, and the value at sale based on some cap rates. And, and this cap rate at stabilization is a straight line growth in the cap rate from five and a half to six at the period of stabilization. Uh, and then here off the left, you can see your sale proceeds. So gross sale proceeds based on that sale minus your selling costs. Uh, then you subtract out some construction loan uh, pay. That's the construction loan payoff at sale. And you have your equity proceeds from sale. Next, you run into returns. And you can see the property level returns here. And the property level cash flows out to the right that, that are uh, resulting in those returns. Here's your IRR on a levered and unlevered basis. Uh, and your net profit on a levered and unlevered basis, your multiple levered, unlevered. You also see yield on cost calculations here, both at stabilization and sale, and your development spread at both points. And then we get into partnership level cash flows. 
And we have the, the option to model either a double promote or a single promote. Uh, if you have multiple GPs uh, with some promote structure to uh, uh, one GP or the other, then you might double promote other, more than likely you're a single promote. So you've got the developer and then you have your capital partner. And then you enter your uh, waterfall assumptions in this section. So your, your hurdle rates, your promote rates. Uh, this here is the equity contribution. So what percentage is the GP contributing relative to the LP? You have the option to include the development fee in the GP's uh, return calculation and cash flows or not. Now, it, there is a development fee regardless, but you may want to look at the returns with development fee or without development fee. And then finally, we have a sensitivity table here at the very bottom where you can sensitize things like vacancy, income growth, expense growth, exit cap rate. We click this update sensitivity table and it's gonna update those metrics based on all of those changes we made above. And with our underwriting done, we come back to the summary tab and we can see things like our stabilize and sale performa, our uses compared to our sources. We can see some key, assumption, uh, key assumptions here on the upper left-hand corner, uh, such as growth rates, our effective rent per square foot. Out here to the right, we see returns at the partnership level and at the return at the property level we see development related metrics uh, such as yield on cost development spread and then down below i've just dropped in some graphs uh, total project cost by month so you can see the costs as they go out here you have uh, your sources equity blue green uh, uh, debt green so you can see here your equity goes out first and then your debt follows you can see how NOI works, where obviously no NOI during construction, and then there's some negative period where uh, there, if, if you recall, the, the, there was three months of, of free rent and the, the tenants weren't reimbursing the landlord for those expenses, so it's a negative NOI, and then over time it grows to a stabilized NOI. And then again, you see some, some return uh, graphs off, off to the right here. So that's... Uh, just a quick walkthrough of my industrial development model. Let me know if you have any questions about this. This was a fun one to do. Uh, great specialized model. Um, let me know what questions you have. Otherwise, thanks for your time.